right in with a question. What do you think of when you think of the Internet of Things? And I'm specifically asking about the things that come to mind when you think of the Internet of Things. Anyone want to shout out Egg what? Crates. What was that? Egg crates. Egg crates? Okay. Any others? <laughs> Wearables. Okay. Any specific ones? Vibrations. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> what was it? I heard one more. One more. So I heard one over here. Nest. Oh, I'm so glad you said that. Thank you. I planted him. So. Um, <laughs> you cannot go to a design conference and have, hear talk about Internet of Things without having a picture of the Nest thermostat, so now you've had it. Um, and this is actually a great example of you know, a little everyday device that connects to the Internet, learns your habits, and changes or adjusts the temperature. You might also think of wearables. Someone said wearables, things that track your health, for example. Maybe you think of things like this home security kit that allows you to monitor your home right from your mobile phone. So these are all great examples of little everyday devices that connect to the internet. But the internet can also connect with big machines. So things like windmills that use data analytics to um, optimize the amount of energy that's produced by the same wind or uh, jet engines that use data analytics to actually fly more efficiently and use less fuel, or gas turbines that um, actually use data analytics to um, let their operators know if they need maintenance. So think of this as the internet of big things. And at GE, we're calling this the industrial internet, and that's uh, one of the things that we're gonna talk about today. But first, we should introduce ourselves. So um, I'm Katrina Alcorn. We, we are the Katrinas. <laughs> and we actually spell our names differently, but uh, we pronounce them the same way. And we did not bring this hurricane, so apologies <laughs> in advance. They have a way of following us. Um, but I've been doing user experience consulting for many years in a variety of industries, including healthcare and nonprofit sector, and now most recently in energy. And I also come from a consultancy background where I now jumped into the energy sector after having worked in the internal design agency in San Ramon, California, where they're working across the different businesses. But now we're really on the business side, so what a lot of you would call the business side. <laughs> um, and so I'm going to be talking to you about some of the challenges that we face as designers in designing for the industrial internet. And I'm going to be continuing after that to talk even more in detail about the type of co-creation we do, talk about the principles that might seem quite basic for you, but how we're then implementing them in this very gigantic organization, because GE is 300,000 people. So keep that in mind as we think about scale. Great. <clears throat> So I was really uh, excited to join this industrial internet team. And one of the reasons is that it's very, very new, but the predictions about adoption are huge. So um, according to one analyst, they say, we believe that the industrial internet opportunity could amount to $2 trillion by year 2020. That's one way of measuring adoption. Another way to measure is to look at the actual devices that are connecting to the internet. So one of the predictions are that there will be 45 billion uh, devices or assets connected by 2025. More than a third of those are that bar on the bottom, and those are all industrial assets. Those are things like the windmills and jet engines that we're talking about. So um, let's back up for a second. What is the industrial internet? And you really probably want to think about, about it as three essential pieces. So, the first one is intelligent machines. And the truth is that often these are dumb machines, they're old machines, but they're being equipped with new sensors so that suddenly we can get all this information about how they're working. And then the next piece is about software and analytics. And this is really where we take all that data and we start to make meaning out of it. <clears throat> and then of course there's the people at work. And these are the people who use the software to get insights about what they need to do to then maintain the machines and use them and get them to work better. 
I'm realizing after a day of talks how geeky this presentation is. Um, but we think it's really exciting at GE because we think that there's a real opportunity to address major global challenges in just about every industry um, and to eliminate waste in just about every industry. So there are many different ways to measure that, right? Um, we'd like to try to measure impact, and one is in dollars. So um, some of the analysts at GE did this experiment where they said, what if we made a very modest uh, change in each industry, if we could just bring you know, a 1% savings, for example, a 1% savings in aviation could equal something like a $30 billion savings in um, fuel savings over 15 years. So then they looked at oil and gas, which is in our industry, and they said, what if we brought about a 1% reduction in capital expenditures? That equals something like $90 billion over the next 15 years. So when you look across industries, we're talking about something like $150 billion in waste. And that's if we just make this one modest little change. Um, I want to point out that these are all dollar numbers, and that may or may not be exciting to you. But a lot of these dollars eat, have an environmental sustainability component. You know, For example, if we're spending less money on fuel, we're burning less fuel. So, um, and the other thing I want to say about here, because this is the session about scale, and this is all about scale. We've had something like 150 years to build up our global infrastructure around the world. And now, all we have to do is make a little tiny change in getting that infrastructure to work a little bit more efficiently, and we can make massive improvements. Okay, do, are you guys convinced yet? This is really cool. <laughs> I'm convinced, um, but it's really hard. It's really hard to design for the industrial internet, so that's what we want to talk about. And there's three specific pieces that we wanted to address. So the first one is around data. Um, some of you may have seen this statistic from TechCrunch. They said that 90% of the data in the world today has been created in the last two years alone, and the rate that that data is being created is increasing. So this is a new problem that we're dealing with. I want to use a specific example. This is going to get really geeky. There's a bunch of numbers, but it's so cool. So specific example from oil and gas. Um, so around the world, there are 2 million miles of trans uh, transmission pipelines moving oil and gas from one place to the other. If you were to take all those pipelines and wrap them around the Earth, they would wrap around the Earth 80 times. So that gives you a sense of how much stuff is out there, how much infrastructure. Now, get this in your head. So half of those pipelines were installed before 1970. So this is aging infrastructure. It runs under rivers. It runs through mountains. It runs you know, near cities, sometimes near schools. So it's very, very important that it is kept in good condition so that nothing goes wrong, right? This presents a really great opportunity with the industrial internet. What if we could take data to, un to monitor those pipelines and make sure that we know when something needs maintenance before something goes wrong, right? It's a great goal. OK, so here's the challenge. So I said there's 2 million miles of pipeline. Now, for every 30,000 miles of pipeline, it generates 17 terabytes of data. That data comes in the form of seismic data, temperature data, there's data about moisture, there's data about movement, vibration, there's um, something called in, uh, a pig that is a little instrument that runs through the pipeline and it um, captures anomalies in the pipeline and tells you if there's anomalies, there's something going on inside the pipeline. There's geospatial data. So you add all this up, 17 terabytes of data. Anyone, any guess about how much that is? Any geeks geekier than us in the audience? <laughs> It's per day. It's per day. So it's more than the entire uh, printed collection of the Library of Congress every day being produced out of this stuff. A lot of data. So when we have more data, we have more problems. You know, First of all, we have an enormous amount of stuff. And so as designers, we have to figure out how do we help people glean insights from all that stuff. Um, and then, of course, there's endless possibilities. So we have to understand. How do people need to use this data so that we can create the experience that they need? Because we can't solve for every single possibility. Um, and then, of course, there's performance issues. And I learned a lot when I helped out in a, a data workshop we did recently. 
And um, what we found is that to run, to run a what if scenario uh, related to a pipeline project, to get the answer to one question could take 24 hours just for the machine to crunch the data. So these are the constraints that we work with as designers and we need tools to deal with them. Okay, next challenge is about our users, our end users. Um, with the industrial internet, we're usually designing for people who have very, very specialized jobs. And those people tend to work in remote locations, sometimes dangerous locations, or sometimes they're just hard to get in touch with. And so this presents a challenge for us because we, you know, so I've designed consumer products in the past, and sometimes you kind of cheat, you can guess what people need. You cannot guess what a sub-C engineer needs. <laughs> you, you have to talk to sub-C engineers if that's who you're designing for. So um, what that means is for us as designers, we really have to be prepared to go the extra mile to do that kind of research. And we wanted to share this one um, kind of funny story. It's an extreme example of the, the sort of hoops that people jump through sometimes to get research in the industrial internet area. So this is a photo of Lauren uh, Bowers. She's one of our interaction designers at GE. And she was designing, um, this is an oversimplification, but she was designing a software product that would help subsea engineers monitor very critical equipment that's under the sea to keep bad things from happening. So, um, so it was important software, and she really needed to understand what their information needs were. So she needed to go out on an oil rig and see how people worked and talk to them and show them some of the design work and get their ideas. But in order to get out on the oil rig, she had to go through these steps. So she got an extensive background check. She got a drug test, which she passed. Um, <laughs> she um, took CPR and first aid training. She took an offshore survival skills training, and this is where she learned things like how to ration food in a lifeboat if you're stranded in the ocean, and how to signal a helicopter for rescue. She did fire safety training in case the oil rig caught on fire. Um, she had to get flown from California to Texas to get a special health exam because they don't give that health exam in California. And then the best part is that she did a helicopter crash course. Now, this is not a helicopter crash course. It's a helicopter crash course. <laughs> so I said, well, what do you do in a helicopter crash course? It sounds really cool. And this is her quote. She said, basically, they dunk you in cold water repeatedly and flip you upside down, and then you have to bust out a window, climb out of the helicopter cockpit simulator, which is underwater, and swim to safety. <laughs> so all of this, this took months just to get to spend a week on an oil rig. And I asked her, you know, was it worth it? Was it worth going through all this? And she said, it absolutely was worth it. Um, and in fact, I, I expected her to say that the week on the oil rig, you know, gave her all these great design insights, and it did. But she said even the process of going through this training to get on the oil rig really gave her empathy for the safety issues involved in the work that these people do every day. So I think that's important to note. So the third challenge is about um, the industrial internet being really new. And when something is really new, it's unknown. And when something is unknown, it can be scary. So often we hear about fears from our customers. We hear a lot about fears around data security, and that's something that GE is spending a lot of time to make sure we get the infrastructure right to deal with those concerns. But we also hear about concerns around change management and around um, this idea that the industrial internet is going to require, these new products are going to require people to work in different ways. So as designers, we need ways to address these fears. We need ways to just deal with all this complexity around these products and bring the right people into the conversation. And we need to find ways to bring our subject matter experts and our end users into the conversation. And that's where we're turning to co-creation at GE. So um, just to kind of def put a definition on this, because everyone uses words in slightly different ways. And some of you may use different terms to describe what we're we're using at GE, the term we're using is co-creation. And what that means to us is processes that bring diverse stakeholders together to achieve breakthroughs in how they solve problems. Um, some of you may call this service design. Some of you may call this design thinking. Some of you may call it strategic conversations. At the end of the day, if I skip ahead for a moment, it often looks something like this. 
where we host these intensive two or three or five day workshops where we've got a bunch of smart people in a room. Um, very important that they represent people from different, different ways of thinking, business and technology and design and end users. And um, you know, we may run through all different kinds of exercises from journey maps to persona workshops to various vision exercises. I expect that you're probably familiar with a lot of these. We're not really gonna go into the methods today, but um, just to kind of level set on the definitions. What we're finding is that co-creation is especially useful, and this, this may be true in your work too, when the solution's not yet defined and when the stakeholders are not yet in clear alignment because these sessions really bring us together. And um, we're seeing amazing results. So, you know, everything from making sure that these sessions help us make sure that we're uh, solving the right problem and that we're defining the solution clearly, but they also, this is super important, they help us create trust with our customers. And this really matters because um, someone was talking about this earlier today about the people problem of design, you know, you can have the best design idea in the world, but if you don't bring people along with you and you don't think, you know, about, about how to get buy-in, nothing's going to happen. You're not going to be successful. So that trust sets a foundation for us throughout the project. Um, it's also helped us engage various stakeholders and it's helped us speed up the sales pro process, which Katrina is going to talk about in a moment. At the end of the day, it helps us avoid costly changes in the future because we're more certain that we're addressing the right problem in the beginning, so we're less likely to change it in code later. So all of this to say, we're in a space where there are a lot of huge challenges. There are environmental challenges, there are safety challenges. How do we actually go about this? Yes, it's co-creation. We also have principles that we're leaning towards. Most of you have talked about principles today. I'm gonna to riff on some of them. They're slightly different, but some quite similar. So you'll see some reference points there. I don't expect that the principles are very different from what you all know and what you're all practicing. But what's different is the context. And that's why we spent this time to also level set you on industrial internet. Because GE, as I mentioned before, has 300,000 people. The energy sector that we're in is 45,000 people. And we're working with some of these thought leaders to really bring this forward. I'm gonna then talk about some of the practices. So I'm gonna go back and forth. Here's the basic list that I'm gonna be going through. I'm not gonna be reading them out to you right now because we'll go one by one. So let's get started. Place design at leadership level. I could probably see a lot of nodding heads here. We all wanna do that, but how do we do that? We're in this lucky situation that our manager is an executive level, which means that there's not that far up to the CEO of a 45,000 people company. And that means that we can actually start to impact a lot of the different business groups that we're working with. The other part is really around how we've done that. So as I mentioned, I've been here for about two and a half years, but we've had a huge impact on that energy management and energy sector that has been really working with some of the principles that we're, about, we're engaging with, both for co-creation, also for user experience. But the one thing I'd say is, don't fight language. Don't let that be your barrier. These are the terms that we use. They're very simplified. User UX is about designing for the end user. Co-creation is about empowering stakeholders to be designers. We can argue that in this forum, but for us, it's really helped to just bring it down to a level where it's super simple, it's super easy, and that can really start to have a huge impact because we don't have the luxury of actually overcomplicating the language that we're using. There's a term out there talks about whoever controls the language controls the debate. What we would actually argue is that this is much more about whoever translates the language can bring people to a common solution. And that's really more what we're wanting to do. It's not so much about owning the debate, owning the language, owning the term, or coining the term. We didn't give you a definition of UX to say and co-creation to be able to say, this is the only way we do it. It's much more to just give you a thought process around, we're also doing what you're doing, but we're doing it really in a big scale. 
Let's jump to the next one. Practicing co-creation, just like an engineering best practice. So I specifically talk about engineering because a lot of us have probably worked with engineering groups, some smaller, some, some bigger. They all have these practices around agile, around lean. We have lots of terms. They have lots of terms. We would like to talk about co-creation and inserting that into much more driven by engineering and in, in this way of getting it to be a best practice. So how do we do that? It's really around this federated facilitation model that we're choosing to call it here. It's around that we would say in the states here, eating our own dog food. How do we do co-creation with our customers, but also with our internal teams? And by the way, when we talk about customers, it's B2B. So we're helping a lot of stakeholders, both internally and externally. So think about this balance. It's a symbiosis relationship where we really need to do co-creation outside, inside, wherever we can, because it's a mindset thinking. So when we go in, we go in and actually facilitate a meeting internally, and we bring things out and bring, bring it out into the field, bring it internally. What the challenge is, if we're not actually doing it internally, if we're just working on co-creation externally, that means that we can be asking our customers for a lot of things. We can be bringing them into the process. We can be making a lot of assumptions. We can actually be telling them that we can do a lot of things. But if we're not doing it internally, we probably can't actually execute on that. On the other hand, if we're only doing it internally, then we probably don't have the right thing to actually execute on because we haven't been bringing our customers into this co-creation process. So how do you find that good balance? One of the ways that we're spreading this message is through brown bag sessions. We're spreading it across internally. We're having sharing sessions where we can really talk about what has been done. And again, many of you are probably doing this internally in your, in your groups but it's really starting to trickle out. It's not just Katrina and I that are hosting these anymore. It's really across the company. The next part is around making relationships that make things happen. One of the things when we were asked earlier about our superpowers that I mentioned is that I tend to, in a very nice way, invite myself to meetings. Because what's important is that we can actually start to have a voice in some of these strategic conversations. Because they might think of a designer, what do they need to do in a strategic meeting around big sales processes that need to change. But we actually do have a voice there. So how can we embed that and how can we start thinking more about that? At the same time, in our projects, we also need to think about some of these people issues being design challenges. We probably all heard some of these terms and some of these phrases. I don't have enough time. There's too many silos. The team is too big. People are too exhausted. We just don't know what to do. But what if these are actually the real challenges that we need to face? So in the projects, Think about how, how can we actually embed that? How can we think about that as a constraint? We might have so many things that we want to juggle with, but if we're not taking this in, into consideration, both for the external co-creation sessions and also for the internal, then I would argue we're not getting very far. To the second to last here, demystifying empathy. So there's been some conversations around that today. And it's great that we all, we all get that. And the challenge I'd say is that we're working for this guy. This guy is our user. How do you actually get empathy, empathy with him? How do you actually go into his mindset? Katrina was mentioning earlier, we don't know what it's like to be a subsea engineer. What do we actually do? And it might be that we here, there's a reason for us being here. We all feel like we're good at empathy. But how can you actually make more people think in that way? One of the ways that we've done it is actually to bring people with us. We take someone's hand. We bring them out in the field. Sometimes it can be challenging if you need a helicopter crash course first. <laughs> but we try to bring them out as much as possible. The other way that's a little bit easier is when we do interviews, we just have them to listen in. 
And it's been really impactful because some of these stakeholders that, are, that say that they know all the users, they aren't necessarily the user. They don't necessarily know everything about what it's like to be this engineer that you saw before. So how can they actually listen in? We've had this way of thinking about it that we did in a recent project where they actually started quoting the end users several times afterwards and saying, wasn't that what John said? So it's, it's really something to think about. I had to censor this picture because it's also about customers. They're, we're bringing them in. There's a lot of sensitivity around how we can actually do it and what we can actually share. But I'd really encourage you to take the design newbies into this insight journey. The last point I'll make for these principles here is helping every touch point without exception be better by design. Again, we can probably all nod and say, yes, that's what we're trying to do. But how do we do it? So one of the ways that we're trying to work on it is really making these realistic plans and trying to insert it at a strategic level. So this is a design process that we're using at GE. You've all probably seen something very similar. I'm not gonna go through them all because we all have each versions of this. But what's really important is co-creation starts up front. It starts in the discovery. Again, we're probably all nodding. Yes, it does, but what if I could actually start even earlier than that? So think about the design process as a project that you're starting with, but the pre-project is where you can actually shape the relationship. You're building it early on. Sometimes customers are coming to us and saying, hey GE, we actually wanna work on this industrial internet with you, how do we do that? And that's when we get brought in to actually shape and figure out what are the constraints? What are the opportunities? How do we actually work together? And that's how we can start influencing design and getting that into more touch points. So to conclude, these are the five principles that we've worked on. These are the practices and some of the very tangible action, actions that we've taken. We would love to talk more with you. There's so much we wanna share, so please come find us in a break. What I would conclude with here is to say that this is cyclical. If design is integrated into more places in the organization, teams are co-creating something that hasn't been co-created before, which means that new relationships are being built, which means that new methods are becoming more approachable to more people, which means that more touch points improve over time as design is being implemented. And you can continue. As, the, as more touch points improve over time, design is integrated in more places, and it goes around. All right, so I wanna leave you with a couple last thoughts about things that you can take back into your own work. Five takeaways. So the first one is about adding co-creation methods to your toolkit. Um, again, I would imagine that given that we're at the service design conference, you're probably using a lot of these methods. We would just encourage you to continue to evolve them. We're constantly trying to learn and evolve. And if you find that your team is working in silos or it's mostly designers in these sessions, break out of those silos, because that's really where the power of this work happens. Or do you want me to, I'll go to the next one. Whoops. <laughs> and as I was mentioning, pre-projects, there's a way to really create these strong relationships. Some talk about it as designing the brief, and some talk about it as strategic design thinking. But how do we really go, get up front? How do we get in on a leadership level and help all of these touch points actually evolve? And that's what we would encourage. Okay. So the third one is about, this has always been best practice in internet design. It's even more so with industrial internet design. Um, make friends with developers and data experts. Katrina and I have been um, actively pursuing our data science team at GE to figure out how we can bring them into our co-creation process because we think that they, you know, they have a big piece of the answer for a lot of the stuff we're designing, so we need to figure out how to collaborate together. And do take your helicopter crash course. <laughs> if not that one, then at least get really prepared to go, on, to go that extra mile to actually do your research. Whether you need training, whether you need to create some better relationships to really have those right contacts to go out. We'd really encourage you to just be prepared. Anything can be considered as a research opportunity. Great. 
And the last one is to plant seeds in your organization. And so it's one thing for all of us here to be practitioners and to use these methods to kind of have, to have an impact on the design of, of solutions. But let's think about how we can empower other people to use these same methods, because that's how we start to change the, the culture of our organizations for the better. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.